welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a technical newcomer into the temple, but not really. <laughs> <laughs> Some of you may know him as the as the man behind the Behold Humanity series, some at, some as that one asshole dragging people into playing Chaos Earth, and uh, and others as the as the guy who <laughs> is is the angriest man in the universe. <laughs> good brother Routes, how you doing today, man? Oh, I'm pretty good. I'm awake, so that's that's a that's a. I'm not sure if that's a plus yet. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you learned the hard way that I, that. <laughs> That I am, uh, I am a always, I am an always active approach kind of thing. Yeah, I'm one of those people that stay up till six or seven or eight in the morning, and then get up late and go, "Oh, why did I sleep so long?" <laughs> oh, God, cause we played. Yeah. God, we played Chaos Earth for like seven hours last last night. Mm -hmm. so. And I'm, <laughs> I've got, I've gotten back into doing actual plays myself on um on kick for the last few for the last few months i've been doing um emberwind um and when we finish up with that campaign we're going to be shifting over to sword world the idea is instead instead of focusing on one game all, all the damn time we're going to be doing a variety all right since well my crusade has always been showcasing what is out there oh that's the reason why i i outright stated i do not want to be another fucking D, &D channel uh, there's yeah. there's enough yeah. there's enough of those and my interest is always showcasing what what else is out there not else not what else is out there from from some myth from some mythical um point point in time but just what is out there in the, what is out there in the indies what is out there in um internationally and so and so on like i think <laughs> but <coughs> Like you, here we go. Like you and I are no are no strangers to each other, but we. Right. But um, I have. But a lot of times when you and I have been on the same calls, it's usually been been around some other pop culture thing. We haven't had a significant opportunity to dive into um into into RPGs. Um, yeah, yeah. It is a it is a bit amusing that you that you're do, that you're doing um Rift's Chaos Earth these days because. I've mentioned this in the past. Rifts and just the Palladium system in general has been a particular whipping boy of mine. Oh. Well, you know, I'm going to throw it out there. I'm going to say something really unpopular. Here's a hot take for mm -hmm. that has everybody pulling blades. Uh, Palladium Rifts is one of the most flexible, easy to understand, and you don't have to. You're not looking through the books constantly unless you're playing a spellcaster, and even then you can get away with some three by five cards than any other system out there. And anybody that bitches about their power creep as their character farts rainbows and casts three, three spells in a round can eat my ass because Rifts is also, the Palladium system is also highly deadly. And a lot of people don't realize that. I mean, they're like, oh, I played Rifts once and I played a baby dragon and the DM could even stop me. Well, I'm sorry that your DM was functionally retarded and never read his book, but uh, baby dragons attract missiles. Yeah. <laughs> and. Truth be told, my my roasting of the Palladium system, although although I, I will note this with it with everything I'm about to say, I'm putting Heroes Unlimited to the side. I will not defend that. <laughs> I will for use in riffs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but as on its own, um, that's the, that's the one. Like, no, fuck that. If I if I it could be interesting. I mean, I played Hero, and I've played. Uh, oh God, what's the other champions? And well, then champ I played, champions uh, and heroes are champions and hero are a yin yang relationship with each other. So, yes. And then I played Palladium Heroes, and once again, once again, Palladium is one where it really comes down to the players and GMs. I mean, if they can't work together, then uh... yeah. But the big bur up my ass for the longest time with the, with Palladium has been presentation. And I know somebody's going to say, yes. "Oh, it does. Oh, it doesn't have enough pretty, doesn't have enough pretty visuals, or or it's not, it's not as colorful as some other books." No, no, that's not it. Yeah. My issue with presentation has always has always been the fact that anybody who's listened to any show that I've ever done 
knows that I am big on navigation. And Sabita was terrible about that. He either didn't have an index, or the index was wrong, or there'd be character classes missing that were in the table of contents. Yeah. <laughs> or the, or the or um or some of the stuff that um Coffin had said about him in that in that expose years ago, where he was where he was insistent on on you on doing analog methods for editing and printing. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a reason why. It's partly because he uh, owned his own printing press. Mm -hmm. Which, fair, fair is fair and all that, but he, but um, I'd I'd say even, I think I think by the time even Rifts came out, um, digital editing and printing had ar had already become more and more of a standard. It was actually I did dig I did digital layout in the in the mid to late nineties. And it sucked. It was, and if he was, you know, from what I heard, he could lay out a book in like two days. And digital editing at the time was so such a goddamn pain in the ass yeah. that you know I could see why he he was able to do it. But I mean, he had a problem with presentation. Mm -hmm. But you know, I got to say, in the later books, I he's up to. What a lot of people don't realize is everybody still thinks that Riffs is only sitting at like four or five books. <laughs> you know, they think it's like D and D where there's like six books. And I'm sitting here right now looking at source book 45. Mm -hmm. And these are not thin books. I mean, it, it used to be, you know, like Mutants in Orbit or, you know, something the books were like 100 pages. No, no, I'm sitting here with the revised edition clocking in at 240 pages. And his prices, his prices aren't as bad as, you know, the big boys. And I ran Chaos Earth for a reason. I mean, a lot of people... We're like, why would you run Chaos Earth? Because Chaos Earth is grim, it's depressing, and it really turns into another settlement needs your help really fast. Mm -hmm. And especially if you have players who, whose ideas are more than just uh, go out, fight monsters, go home and sleep. Uh, it, but what it does is if you take new players who have never played the Palladium game system before and you start them with Chaos Earth, by the time you shift to Rifts like we did last night... They've got this setting down because the biggest thing, and this is what really I had to break them of, is I'd be, you know, they'd have a laser rifle, they'd be like five, they'd be like 150 feet away, and they'd be like, all right, I'm just going to shoot at him. What do I, what, what do I need to roll to hit? And I go, well, let's see, you've got you've got a smart link, your armor's hooked in because it's chaos earth, not rifts. So they've got all the tech. Uh, I need a five or better. On, on, I need a five or better after you add your bonuses. Mm -hmm. But a one is an auto fail, and they're like, "Wait a minute, I have like plus eight to strike with a with a laser rifle." Yeah, and they're like, "But I would have to roll a one." Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I just I looked through I looked through my archives. I do have three books from um, Chaos Earth. Um. So even even though Riffs is my whip, even though I've made fun made fun of Riffs, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say that that, that there's no merit or something like that. In fact. Yeah, it could it could be argued that I'm too nice at times, but I'd but I always I always try to see the good or the potential in games that I have that I've covered. Well, um, I'm telling you, my players were really happy. They played Pathfinder, they played Five E, and one of them was looking through and said, "Hey, uh, you said there's a couple railguns laying around in the wreckage of this army convoy. <clears throat> Is there any chance I could put one together?" And I was like, uh, "You don't need to put one together. Some of them are ready to go. They're just out of ammo, and you've got the same type of ammo." And they're like, "Wait a minute, you're gonna let me have a railgun?" I was like, "Yeah, give you a perception check." You know, they gave you a perception check. And I was like, "Oh, look, you know, you found a you found a short range missile uh, tube fired missile launcher." You know, fire and forget, throw away the tube. Mm -hmm. And they're like, you're actually going to give this stuff to me? And it's like, it's just a fucking railgun. Relax. Because they are so used to, you know, D&D &D and everything else acting like if the characters get any kind of item of power, the game vanishes up its own ass. And who gives a shit if he's got a... a you got, people forget. Rifts is a game where you can get a power armor at start that does three dice six times ten pull t per trigger pull. I mean, if you're if you're a standard dude in, in regular body armor and that thing hits you, you're just fucking dead. <laughs> yeah. There's there's no hope. But so I ch I checked the three th the three items that I've got when it comes to Chaos Earth is of course the main book, um, Creatures of Chaos and Rise of Magic. That's all you need to play. Mm -hmm. That's the other thing that startles people. This is literally all you need to play. Mm -hmm. And 
Although I, I will admit, when it comes to whipping boys, um, I I give I give some I give some of the GURPS crowd a bit more shit than I do the oh God, I yeah. do the Rifts crowd. Mostly, and it's it's not anything against GURPS itself. It's more it's more the people who keep insisting, oh the, oh oh you can you can do and you can do anything with GURPS, which is a case of technically correct but still wrong. You can do anything with Griff, with uh, Gerps if you can find a DM who doesn't want to kill himself. <laughs> you know how you know how a lot of how a lot of um, session how a lot of campaigns will have a session zero where everybody makes their characters and gets a feel for what they're going to be do what they're going to be doing what the tone of the whole thing is going is going to be and all that. Rifts not not Rifts some um, bl- Gerps can have three session zeros. Yeah, just dealing with all and once the once the additional books come in, it be, it stops becoming a game and becomes a cry for help. I've told people, you need to stop looking at universeless games like like GURPS or Hero or or whatnot as individual games. You need to start looking at them as a programming language, or yeah. um, or a or the the um, common analogy I use is the blue bucket of Legos. Um, yes, and. It's it's that's not that's not a condemnation. That's not me saying that that what that what they're doing is a bad thing. It's more of this is something you need to keep in mind so you don't get the so you don't get the wrong idea as to what it's doing. And if you've seen any of my reviews, you'd you'd note that I don't really do the out of ten thing because there can be arguments for and for and against that, with, regardless of what I pick. Right. So it's more it's more about who I'm willing to recommend something to. But something that some but something that I've I've talked with you about that I always find amusing is this narrative <clears throat> that there's certain things that I have to draw from if I'm doing um fantasy or if I'm yes. doing science fiction. <clears throat> um and I've always I've always found that ridiculous because it's it's the kind of thing that comes from that can only come from that ivory tower attitude where they where you've got the people like like we're the true role players we don't want, we don't want any of the, any of those video gamers or or weeaboos on oh. in our sh- in our shit and I'm like I've seen I've gone th- I've gone through so many forums with pe- with people who are fa- who are fans of of various manga and the, and like and seen very creative um char- character building that they've done and I'm like you guys are si- you guys are sitting on so much potential all all because it's all because it's not it's not your you, security blanket do you want to know what the anti anime thing really is about and I know this because I used to be heavily involved in die 20 creation back when it first came out as a matter of fact I received the roughs what well, I I received the roughs in a three in three ring binder shipped to me by FedEx from Wizards that I had to sign for after I gave them an NDA. I had my hands on the die twenty basic. This is what we're going to try to do. When most people didn't even know it was out there. Mm-hmm. Well, most people didn't even know it was. It was before the Gen Con announcement, the the year that it came out that I got my hands on it. But afterwards, you know, I was really involved with it, and I was, you know. I had always liked the idea of marshals that can do stuff, and 3.0 represented such a power boost for mages. It was unreal. They removed the limitations that mages had from first from first edition, and some of the uh, limitations they had from second edition. And the caster supremacy problem was so obvious that, I mean, it was so obvious that. It should never have made it through. And I remember talking about on a on a designer forum once about hey, you know, adding giving marshals some cool abilities beyond feats, or maybe you have to spend a feat to unlock it, would be really fucking cool for them. And everybody started screaming anime bullshit. And I'm like, oh, you're gonna talk about anime bullshit when you're when you think you should be able to cast overland flight so you can bob around the combat like a balloon, and why you shit glitter, throw lightning bolts, and have an invulnerable force field? And go fuck yourself. One of, it was always about oh no, now my wizard can't take over everybody's place. Yeah, it, it because pre- it pretty much it, yeah. it pretty much was and. Now we we could go with the extreme examples of as you said people farting rainbow bullshit, but I want to go with a bit more of a mundane example to illustrate the problem. 
what is the what is the point of having a thief in your party to to undo locks when the wizard can cast knock and just undo that lock? You know what I used to do to, pe to people who did that? The traps would go off. Oh, I, I, and the um, right there. I had, I had, I had, me I had messed with it so that so that knock would only work on ma on magic locks, and then f and then fill a dungeon with no with non magic locks where they tr they try to do that and it and it does nothing and they've just w they've just wasted their spell slot. The but the point is is that it's very it's very hard for me to buy the argument of of giving of giving martial maneuvers is somehow stepping onto the toes of spellcasters when spellcasters are stepping on the toes of everyone else as is whether it be through completely invalidating other other whole archetypes mm -hmm. or having or having certain archetypes be entire parties by themselves have you ever heard of yeah. Godzilla uh, yes i've also heard of uh mr magic and those other three assholes yeah, Mr. Meh. Um, and of course, I would bring up Pun Pun, but Pun Pun was was never was never meant to be played. It was meant it was meant to yeah. be a thought experiment. So that doesn't really count. But Godzilla, the whole cleric or druid, was to reflect the fact that um, somebody who knows what they're doing with either of those classes or both of them, if they multi-class, is an entire party by themselves. Yeah. Hence the hence them being referred to as playing on um, easy mode. Well, this... the other big thing is uh, mm -hmm. D and D. D and D has you know ever since second edition has long had a problem with uh okay the D and D the D and D culture that started around two thousand and five very much turned into you have to say yes to the players about everything. Now there was this feeling in the eighties and some of the nineties that oh a good good DM can adapt to every anything. Well, yeah, but I'm sorry, I have a counterpoint, Kender, and uh, they would build, make these ridiculous builds and then tell you, oh, a good DM could adapt to them, or they'd be like, okay, I want these spells and I want to find these magic items. And as a DM, you were supposed to say yes. When I had a really bad habit of looking at that and going, no, go fuck yourself. <laughs> well, then I don't want to play with you. Well, get your shit and get out of my house. <laughs> yeah, that it. That is very much a case of pe of people um people pl people playing people playing as if they're the protagonist. Um, mm -hmm. This something that has been nicknamed that guy. Mm -hmm. You know, that guy is the one is the one who won't bring who won't bring his books to the table. That guy is the guy who who um will eat every will eat all the snacks but won't bring the, won't bring their own. Yeah, that guy is the guy who will take the, take the most. Um, autistic interpretations of the of the rules only when it benefit. benefits them. Yes. Um, and the and um, they're they're the ones who will get will get the most salty when the when they end up with a GM who actually is that good and knows that bullshit and is able to outwit them. Um, I mean, I've I've rewarded characters. I back when it was just I think that. Let's see, the Monster Manual had just come out, and <clears throat> aside from the stuff that I had written mm -hmm. and some stuff from Green Ronin, there wasn't really that much out there. And uh, he came up with a really – I can't remember the combination, but he came up with a really cool combo. And it was it, it was a combo somebody could take by, like, fourth level for a, for a fucking fighter. And, you know, it was a pretty – it was a really good combo. And I rewarded him by having him. the next time he rolled into a major city, there was people claiming to be him, offering to teach people for like ten thousand gold how to fight like him. And he, he actually liked it. But I mean, it really depends on your players because I've had other players that presented me with this janky. This only works if you interpret the rules the way I want you to interpret them. And me looking at that and going, "Do you think I'm stupid?" Mm -hmm. And them fucking throwing a crybaby fit, and me being like, "Get your shit, get out of my house." Yeah, I've I've considered myself fortunate that I haven't had too many issues of that. I think it, I think it's largely because nobody wants to try and pick that kind of verbal fight with somebody who's a foot taller than them. Yeah, <laughs> that that and um, there's a certain punishment game that I have whenever I whenever somebody tries to pull bullshit. Um, there you have to you have to. You have to drink either a bottle of bacon soda, that's B A C O N. <laughs> oh wow! It is, 
It tastes like bacon grease mixed with club soda. It's absolutely disgusting. Or you have to drink the pain glass, which is yeah. a shot glass full of water, salt, sea salt, pepper, black pepper, Tabasco, Tabasco sauce, Frank's red hot sauce, tiger sauce, sriracha, and one ra- and one random hot sauce I get I get off of the hot ones list, and I ground up jalapeno I would have, seeds. I would have drank that some days when I was when I was hungover just to get the taste out of my mouth. <laughs> Oh, that's where you wake up and you're like, "Who are you, the yeah. maid?" No, 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 Mrs. Rawls. Oh fuck! <laughs> if like when when I used to do game nights when we and we'd all play Golden Night, we had the rule of anybody who picks odd job, we're all allowed to punch you in the nuts afterwards. Yeah. And if, hey, if you uh, <laughs> went through Golden Night back in the day, you know why we had that. Oh yeah, yeah, that smaller hit box. Mm-hmm. What's funny is I I used to let my daughters when they were like really because they were really little I would let them play odd job. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, well, then, if it weren't for the weird ass aiming controls back in Goldeneye, you wouldn't really have that problem. And I've I've tried to do some digginess to figure out why that became a thing because odd job in the movies was stocky, but he was he wasn't a dwarf. Ah. no you he was he was sto- he was stocky and a wide boy. But not, but not, um, not min, not mini me short. I've the best I've been able to find out is that it was a programming error. Which, given that Rare was using a whole bunch of new tech at the time, I'm not going to say that's what happened, but it's plausible. Like when you when you do, you've heard you you're no doubt familiar with the phrase teething troubles. With what troubles? Teething troubles. Yes, like I know. I know that's mostly in military engineering, but I think the same thing can happen with when you're dealing with new tech and just programming just as much. Like per, there's a there's a reason why the why why the programmer's drinking song <laughs> is is just a nightmare version of ninety nine little bugs in the code. Yeah, you know, you think you've got one down now? There's a hundred and eight bugs in the code. Yay, I fixed the only bug I found. Why the fuck won it? Oh my god, what's wrong with my program? Why is my computer on fire? <laughs> Which that's that's why when whenever I've whenever I've gone to a new job and I've had to <laughs> I've I've um I've in, I've intentionally made made a bunch of Reuben sandwiches for the IT department and hand them out my yeah. first day. Is it a bribe? Yes. <laughs> Is it there to make sure that they that they that they don't target me if they end up if one of them ends up snapping one day? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> if you if you snap, uh, remember I brought you sandwiches and do me quick. <laughs> yeah. And well, the reason I go with a Reuben is because most people, if they're going to do sandwiches, they go with like ham and cheese or peanut butter and jelly. Yeah. Going the extra mile with a, with a Reuben um, is is a show of I'm not I'm not screwing around with this kind of stuff. Oh. Um, because of course, trying of course trying to make like trying to make like six or seven Rubens in the span of a day is not going to be an easy feat. No. And that and that's kind of that's kind of the point. <laughs> but I will I will admit that some of, some of the attitudes I've had have been have been accused of me, quote unquote, young splaining, because apparent because <laughs> apparently apparently it, there's something wrong with me for talking about. Um, for talking critical about the attitudes of pl- of players in pr- in past eras when I wasn't in, when I didn't grow up in those eras I was born in 87 I I ar- I argue that um that it that is in, that um that's basically saying that the only people who can talk about chainmail are the people who pl- who played it uh, in the Midwest or some shit no, no I, I'm going to bring something up apparently you know back in the day when I started playing uh, I started playing, and the monster. I, no, one of the books wasn't out yet. I can't remember if it was a Dungeon Master's Guide or Monster Manual. Um, but one of them wasn't out yet. Um, but I see these people all the time with shit like I've been playing D in their bios. I've been playing D and D since 1976. I've been playing D and D since 1978. Since 1981. No, you haven't. Maybe White Box. Maybe the old white box D- basic D and D set, maybe, maybe chainmail, maybe. But um, no, you haven't. I had somebody trying to tell me they were playing AD and D since 1980. I was like, 
No, you weren't. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, was... I will, I will be, I'll be flat out honest. I started with the black book era. The black books are the black books are terribly underrated. They are, they were a breath of fresh air that was so fucking needed, and they mm -hmm. were optional. Uh, the one I liked was the the one for warriors, and well, I liked the players' options, the basic ones where it had how to split up the the ability scores, mm -hmm. and I liked all the options for fighters. Yeah, and I I do remember I do remember at one point I wanted to take the, um. Take take a ver do do a mix between the um, roll for exceptional that was used in in strength for that, and combine that with the ability codes that I saw in the saga system to create a semi classless affair, where what your class was was literally determined by your ability scores. Yeah, I wasn't too in love with classless. <clears throat> I'd played, I'd been playing Shadowrun, Twilight Two Thousand, Traveler stuff like that. Which, mm -hmm. when you get down to it, are basically classless. They ver they very oh. much are. And um, what annoys me about Shadowrun is that it tries to pretend it isn't. Oh, with the archetypes. Yeah, it's like shit or get off. My ad my attitude is shit or get off the pot. Because Originally, you have a reason for that. Uh, according to Nigel Finley, uh, who I would talk to back in the day before he died in that car wreck, uh, he uh, said that the reason why they did the archetypes in the books, number one, so that because this was a whole new radical system, people could just jump in because character creation was a pain in the ass. And number two, because he felt that people would be more comfortable if there was the appearance of character classes. No. But I don't know if they've changed it since, you know, second edition because they came out with third edition. <laughs> LOL, no. <laughs> um, not, not really. It still is. It still is classless and still is in, insisting on those archetypes. Um, even even the harebrained games, it's st it's still doing that, which is, which, even which those ones simplified in that. And um, I remember I remember getting a bit of flack for defending sixth edition because that vastly simplified things like the skill system it made edge into this momentum thing that constantly shifted in some instead of something that you hoarded for that rainy day paradox um <laughs> so i never played anything past second where you had your dice pools <laughs> fifth 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 and sixth edition have a op, have an optional approach no, known as priorities for built for building characters where you assign a priority grade to things like skills attributes meta type whether or not you're whether, ah. whether or not you're picking magic, and it gives you a pool of points to spend based on the um, priority that you pick, and each of that's those actually avenues... out of first edition. That's actually out of first edition when you're making your own character. It's a little it's a little box grid with columns and rows where priority A. If you want to be able to cast magic, you have to put magic as your priority A. Mm -hmm. If you want to be a meta human, you have to put put a meta human as priority A, unless you're magic and then it's A B. It was oh. really a cool way to do it to the point where I used it in D and D for a long time. Yeah, because for me, it, the problem that I've always the problem that I've always had with how with with the type of character creation that people swear by in Shadowrun is is it's a case of what I I've that I've given two nicknames to. One of them is um, swim, damn it. You know, pushing someone mm -hmm. in the pool and just telling them to swim without get, without yeah. giving them any direction. The other is hand breaking. I know a lot of people rail on hand holding in game design. I honestly think hand breaking deserves just as much hate. You need hand holding in the beginning. Everybody does because the concept, well, not so much anymore, but originally the concept was so foreign to a lot of people that people got into it later when once they were able to, you know, set aside stuff that would have enjoyed it when they were a lot younger. I mean, I don't know how many people I heard in the 90s and early 2000s that were like, where the fuck has this been all my fuck you know, all my fucking life, man? I've always wanted something like this, and I was like, you know, I used to fucking invite you to play with me, you jerk ass. Oh yeah. well, you know, I that things were different. <laughs> so, I I decided to I decided to load up the um, sixth edition core book so I can so I can demonstrate the prior the, the priority system that they have there. I'm on the back the, porch smoking a cigarette, so yeah. I can't see your screen. <laughs> um. I'm not. I'm not screen sharing. I don't. Oh, okay. I don't like screen. Sh I don't like doing screen sharing. But the the um the neither do I. Neither do I. You'll see my porn tabs. <laughs> but the uh, the um the priorities that you that you the priority grades are A through E. 
and you assign it to um, meta type, um, attribute points, skill points, magic, or or magic based on whether you're doing um, what what type of mage you're doing, or if you're doing an adept, or if you're doing a technomancer, um, and then money. Yeah, yeah, that's actually from first and second edition. Yeah, the only... they brought that back. Mm -hmm. They brought that back in fifth. The um, sixth simplifies the s skill system. I'm not saying it's, I'm not saying it simplified it to the point of say, D to say um, 5e, but it, it but it is nowhere near as exhaustive as the skill list got. And I've truth be told, I've never been a fan of those, ma those massive hundred page long skill lists in some games. Because and the reason why is. You end up you you end up you can end up with a sunk cost fallacy that ends up dissuading you from taking new skills because yeah. you've got because you've got to catch up with skills you've already invested in. That's what I like about Palladium is here's your skills, boom, you go up percentage wise the whole time because mm -hmm. they you know Palladium assumes that your character in, his, in their off time is studying their skills. Yeah, and because skills in that game really make a difference. Yeah, the on, the only thing that's changed is. Fourth edition introduced the concept of technomancers, which were essentially, ha which were essentially hackers that didn't need equipment. Um, this this sort of hybrid between hackers and ma and mages because they could use resonances. Technomancers are not popular. Um, and of course, truth be told, most of the time that I most of the time that I end up playing in Shadowrun, I'm either I'm either doing um, full-on street Sam or I'm doing adept. Yeah, I loved adepts. I love physical adepts, and people will thought I was crazy until, you know, because at first your adept can be a little weak. But I mean, four karma points in second, first and second edition, four karma points were all you needed to turn your fucking adept and to be able to hang with the street yeah. Sam. Um, eventually, they introduced the concept of mystic adepts, which are kind of a halfway point between oh. adepts and mages. You know, an adept now you can describe it as an adept is pretty much a dude like either Jackie Chan or Jet Li or, you know, or some of the, or some of the um, or or even some of these some of the um, people I see competing in strongman competitions. You know, the yeah. ones that are pulling buses. Yeah. And I, that's not a bus. Buses plural. <laughs> yeah. What was wrong with your human body? <laughs> oh. Like I've. <laughs> I've I've gone down my fair share of rabbit holes of just seeing just seeing the extreme ends of of what um of what people who've tr who've trained can d can do. Oh, um, it blows people's minds. People lift a half to oh, half to three quarters of a ton now. Mm -hmm. And of course, one of the, one of the people involved that that, I, that I've been watching has been Eddie Hall, who won the world's strongest man competition in 2017. And these days, um, goofs about in exper in experimenting with uh, with other other sport other sports and the like, and yeah. getting an appreciation for what other people are able to do. Because uh, one of them was lumberjack sports, because that's actually a thing. Yes. Oh yeah, I know. And hello, one, Dick. <laughs> one of the <laughs> one of one of the contests was was this overhead chop thing where you've got your You've got you've got some plating on your on your legs so that you don't cut, so you don't hit your own yeah. damn legs, but you have to stand on a log and you've got to you've got to chop it till you get to the midway point, then turn around and chop the other half and, until you get to the midway point. Um, the record is ninety seconds. Yeah, it took oh, him yeah, three minutes. <laughs> it took him it, like three minutes. I got an appreciation. I used to run cross country when I was younger. Mm -hmm. um, I was a runner, and I was a marathoner. And it was uh, I, I was good enough that I was moved. At, you know, ninth grade, you're usually junior varsity, no matter how good you are. Mm -hmm. They moved me to varsity because yeah, I was pretty good. And uh, they had the football. The the coach heard his football players mocking us for running around all the time. He's like, all right, you know, they're like, oh, we could do that because we run laps around the field. He's like, all right, you guys can go out with them today, and uh, run ten miles. They were sucking wind and, before they got to the first mile, weren't they? Uh, but some of them hung to almost the third mile. But afterwards, you know, afterwards, some of those guys came and trained with us for cross country, and you could tell because of the whole game, their energy level for you know they'd be like the running back. Mm -hmm. You know, 
and he'd be out there for the rest of the game, just like everybody else would be exhausted. Fourth quarter, he's out there doing pirouettes and shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, it's 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 a it's very much a case of different different muscles are get different muscles and different yeah. parts of the body are going to u- be used depending on disciplines, uh, which is and w- one of the um, one of the lumberjack game c- contests is do- is doing the whole saw- sawing off a log with one of those back and forth saws, and I've seen I've seen people go through that thing in like thirty eight seconds. Yeah, where and it's it is it is largely a it is largely a technique and a rhythm thing, so that you so that you can keep sawing and not get the thing stuck. Because sometimes, sometimes it's some events are a two-man thing. Most of them are a one-man thing. You've got a bigger handle, but you've got but you've got to cut through that. You've got to cut, do a clean, um, straight cut as as best as you can in the shortest amount of time. But I was it, like the log rolling competitions. Like get there, try to keep their balance on and roll the log for mm-hmm. like ninety seconds. Yeah. <laughs> uh it's. I've d- I've done lo- I've done log rolling in, in the past. That is not easy, because we did we did as kids just to do it because stupid kids. Yeah, and I'm I'm no str- I'm no stranger to, I'm no stranger to that. Given some of my stunts, le- least of which being the whole being the whole thing of jumping off a billboard, um, and the guy who was supposed to catch me screwed up at catching me, which I don't know how you do that when when I'm so damn big. Uh but. You can never make something idiot proof. Uh, you've 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 served. You know how you know how pe- you know how dumb people yeah. can be. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. It's it's retardation all the way down. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is which is why I appreciate the um. I will always appreciate the E four memes. <laughs> so because I've had I've had enough stories relayed to me that I know that I know that some of those are not memes. Those are truths. And well. A lot of truths are said in jest. Um, of course, of course, and of course, I wouldn't be surprised if a bunch of people making E4 memes came out of Fort Polk. The yeah. one, the one base I don't know anybody who has anything nice to say about. Well, a lot of them come out of uh, Fort Hood, <laughs> and Fort Hood is in a class all of its own. Okay, buy or sell? Would you say would you say it's better or worse? Than Polk. Worse. 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 I was at Fort Polk for about two months back when they were decommissioning. I want to say it was 3ID. It was funny. I got there. I got to, I got to Fort Polk. I in processed. I get to my unit and my CO, you know, went in the CO's office to get my briefing. He goes, Oh, welcome to the unit. We're casing the colors in 30 days. So, and then we're going to Fort Hood. And I was like, God damn it. I just left Fort Hood. <laughs> so. <laughs> so you you leave Fort Hood, you go to the Union, only to find out you're going back. Yes, that that they're casing that they're that they're moving the unit, they're casing the colors and moving the unit to First Cavalry Division. I was like, just fucking kill me. <laughs> and and he's like, what do you mean? I was like, I just left Cav. I just got out of that shithole, and now I have to go back. He goes, you know what? Uh, we'll talk to personnel. And we'll get you, we'll get you a new set of orders when we leave, so you don't have to go back. <laughs> right? You're gonna love this. I go back. I get my new orders, and they and I'm like, God damn it! They sent me to Fort Hood. <laughs> I get to Fort Hood. I go through the fucking 21st replacement. They send me to my unit. I show up at my unit. My CEO's like, Wow, back again, huh? How's it going? <laughs> I was like, I hate the army so much. <laughs> I literally ended up in the same unit I had been in before I PCS. I was like, I hate the army so much. <laughs> yeah, that. Oh, man. And I'm, pr- I'm pretty. Sh- I'm pretty sure if you ended up going th- going through the thing to get new orders, that you would have gone through the exact same thing again. <laughs> oh, he was like, "Hey, you want want me to try to get you to PCS orders?" I was like, "We all know I'm going to end up right back here somehow." <laughs> Oh, that was that was the '90s. '90s were terrible. <laughs> um, although we had before we went live, we had talked a bit about the OGL fiasco that happened in January, and oh, I God. can't I can't help but look at that as a case of um, of those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it because Lorraine Williams try had had tried to do the whole let's move let's move things into into 
the general stuff and not, and not of hobby stores when everybody said that was a bad idea. And then yeah. it ended up being yeah. a bad idea because they yeah, overproduced. Be a bad idea. They, they overproduced and, um, tr and, tr and, Tried to, tried to appeal to a tried to appeal to a market and fell for what I've called the greener grass fallacy. You know that grass is only green because of all the radiation. Lorena Williams thought that uh, if she made them put it out, that she she held the she held the consumer in contempt. Oh yeah. And she was like, well, if we put it out, they'll buy it. And uh, the funny thing is, is uh. When Wizards of the Coast took over, because I knew people who got into Wizards of the Coast uh, from the ground floor, and they were telling me about they went to one of the warehouses and opened it up, and there was so much overprint stuff. The big one was uh, the big one was uh, of overprint was believe it or not, for all the people that claim that Dark Sun was you know super super popular, it really wasn't. <laughs> It's uh, developed a cult it, following, probably because yes. probably because it was very different. But I also well, remember Al I also remember people swearing that Alquadim was was in the same vein, yes. and I know that one was not was um was not at, was nowhere near was, as popular. It was a Alquadim was about as popular as herpes at the time, um, and and uh, Dark Sun had those weird spiral notebooks in them, and nobody liked that shit because they were a pain in the ass. But they opened the warehouses and they found all kinds of stuff for Buck Rogers and Al Kneem and Dark Sun. She hated that Ravenloft was so insanely popular. And she hated the Forgotten Realms. And She probably hated she, that people rejected the Buck Rogers RPG. Yep, and what's funny is the Buck Rogers RPG wasn't that bad. It, w it was it actually wasn't. pretty good. I... I had posited a bit of a theory that, and and some may call this crackpot. Some may say, some may say I'm too I'm too young to be t to be talking about this. But first off, who the fuck was going to know who, who the fuck in the gen in the general public or even in the even in the TSR fan base who Buck Rogers was in 1986? Actually, you'd be um, there'd been that no that was a Flash Gordon movie. But uh, yeah, yeah, you know, now that you think about it, I mean, we all actually there, knew who Buck Rogers was. We really there did. There was there was the show back in the late seventies, but that but again, nineteen eighty six. But you they know. yeah, but they re, but they had the they ha, they re put it out again in the eighties. But a lot of people knew who Buck Rogers was. The problem is, is they don't want to play a game in the universe of Buck Rogers. It's the same problem with Marvel and DC superhero games. You don't want to play in the same universe as Superman. Here's, you want to be Superman. Here's a bet. Here's a better example: TSR Indiana Jones. Oh God. Where the, everybody at, everybody ignored that. At least with Marvel Face Rip and DC Heroes with Mayfair, they at least they they eventually got the hint. Like the original Marvel Face Rip didn't have character creation. It wasn't until the first uh, it wasn't until the advanced book where they finally got they finally got the hint. Indiana Jones, they had they had it in their head that people would only want to play as the cast from the, from the film. And that's really fucking stupid because I would I would venture, and this is probably where you're going. People don't want to play as the char as the characters in those universes. They want to play within that universe itself. Nobody wants to play as nobody wants to play as Cyclops, but they do. But they do want to play as an X as an X Man. Yeah, I, Cyclops was, was overpowered as fuck. Yeah, and I'm I'm using him as an, I'm using him as yeah. an example to to illustrate the point. <laughs> Um, I ended up ha as as much of a fan as I am of Avatar. I ended up having that problem with Avatar Legends, and I tell people to go to go with some of the fan made projects in that universe because the official game fell for this exact same trap, thinking that people wanted to play at as the characters from the from the TV show, and that and that's nev that's never how this th how this kind of thing has worked. But the the other the other um the other reason I, I say those who do not learn from history with the OJL <coughs> thing is I did a post mortem video which is on my channel you you might have to scroll back a bit on the matter and when I looked at the chain of events leading up to it because I didn't think anybody else was 
they were just focused on the problem on the problem with the proposed OGL was one the new person who was coming in had a background in the gaming division at Microsoft two was that was the fact that around that time Hasbro was getting hounded in the press regarding the regarding the overproduction of uh, magic cards they oh, still are they, and when I say getting hounded in the press, I'm talking fucking Bloomberg was ta was calling them out on this. <laughs> that and then there was that comment that the that the head had made about how they consider the players under monetized. And the vibe I was the thing I was being reminded of the whole time was the first incarnation of the XFL. Not the one not the current one, the one that's going to be merging with the new USFL which Seems to have most of its du most of its ducks in a row. Just the has... original XFL was yeah. fucking cringe. And specifically, when there was that interview that Vince McMahon did with Bob Costas, where Costas just ate him for breakfast, and it was very very clear that Vince had no understanding of football culture. Because he was asked who his favorite football player was, and he said Wahoo McDaniel. Wahoo McDaniel never played pro. He was only he was only a college player in Texas, which, yeah, he was a big deal. But anybody who plays college ball in Texas is going to be a big deal, big whoop. Yeah, <laughs> that's not to, that's not to diminish Wahoo Wahoo McDaniel's contributions. It's ch it's just Texas. But I the peop the people who were pushing those decisions had no idea of the um, ecosystem that is unique to tabletop role playing games. No, and the, the ecosystem right now is full of garbage and uh, garbage and and uh, intrusive species. <laughs> well, yeah, there's de there's definitely I've seen I've seen there's definitely that. Although I've seen some people use that as an excuse to black pill or not try anything new, and I'm like, you guys are a bunch of fucking pussies, because <laughs> because that because I see that our, I see that people go with that and say, well, well, because well because it's all it's full of a bunch of flotsam and jetsam, we need to go back to to the day, to the days of white box and I'm like go fuck yourself. I'm not I'm not do I'm not doing I'm not doing Thaco, I'm not I'm not doing spells per day. I'm certainly not doing martial characters doing nothing but basic attack. You you guys can go you guys can go get fucked in your in your ivory tower while I'm laying sticks of dynamite under it. <laughs> you want to know what's funny is I had a group and I took them back to 1E. Mhm. Mm and I said, look, you need to either get the PDFs or you need to get the books because this is, you know, they were experienced 5e players, you know. And I was like, uh, and I was like, well, I can run 1e or 2e for you. I can run. And they were like, let's do 1e, you know. And, you know, they were all, they all had this attitude like 1e was, you know, the equivalent of a monkey sticking a stick in its nose to uh, the carriage driving, top hat wearing 5e. And I'm like, look, you have no idea what this is going to be like. And. The big, you know, what startled them the most, the sheer deadliness. Mm -hmm. I can, I can, I can understand that, and I've, I have seen a lot of people, ro um, arguably over romanticize, de um, deadliness in role playing games. Oh, like everybody talks, everybody has this mythical understanding of the, um, character creation deadliness in, tra in Traveler. But oh yeah, that was that was part of the system that made it so fun. But I've 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 always I've always had the argument of, um, I feel that there should be the potential for a variety of of games and game styles, not the yeah. one true way attitude that some, that some people do, which is which is why I get which is um why I'm why I'm so harsh on this whole oh we we need to go back that's the solution I'm and I'm I'm sitting here going there's a but there's a bunch of I'm not I'm not um. I'm not. Say, I'm not trying to say that um, white boxes, monkey flinging shit, or or something like that. But it's more right. that there's there are too many things from that from that er, from that era that do not match my style and my, and my philosophy. Like I, I want I um I I want to I I want to do more more heroic fiction instead instead of the instead of the Okay. Tr okay. Everybody, track how many torches and ten foot ro and ten feet of rope that you ha that you have. There's nothing wrong with that. That's just not what I want to yeah. do. But that doesn't suddenly invalidate um, my abilities as a GM or, or as a role player the way some people argue it would. 
because the people arguing that they yeah. they and then at the same time want to want to say that nobody knows how to how to role play because they because their background is in video games. I'm like, people have to start somewhere. And if you, that's if, the thing that gets me, everybody starts somewhere. These guys act like they sprang from Gary Gygax's forehead, you know, like you know, like Arneson hit Gygax in the head with an axe, and well, there's, guys there's also the fact that something. there's also the fact that um, if you want to if you if you want to get on people for not knowing how to role play right, that it. Is that is that a failing of them or is that a failing of the of the tools that they've been given? Both, <laughs> and a failure and a failure of their GM. Yeah, I mean, and the, shit. Uh, and, you know what? I'm gonna say it. Mm -hmm. You know, the if I had a choice, you know, both of what's been labeled Sparkle Trolls and the uh, and the hardcore, you know, new series of Grognards who were like twelve in 2010 if i could i would take them both and mash them in a ball and just you know pull them off a cliff because they're because, they're both uh, shitty and di they're both shitty and shitty in different uh, avenues but the same unique, result in unique ways yeah and you know it's like i don't want to play with either of you you're over there talking about how your way is the only way to gm and you know what i found out a lot of these people that tell you the correct way to play haven't played a game with other people in t either ever or in ten years. Well, that's that's why that I use the, the I, that's why I use the ivory tower analogy. Yeah, because because that's that's very much that's very much the the approach that's la that's laid out. Now, the 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 big the big thing that's up the that's up the ivory tower people's um, ass. Over, over the last few years, has been, has been people e either people coming in with with a background in MMOs or the idea of t of of RPG design taking notes from video games in general and, M and MMOs specifically. And I always I always find that kind of thing ridiculous because so so much of what so much of what made what made what made the game what made games from the past is just people drawing upon things that they happen to be fans of. So yeah. what so how I don't think that magically changes just because video games are involved. And for a while I would engage in the oh oh a a RP a video game RPG isn't going to be a true role playing experience and I'm like one no but nobody's are nobody's um advancing that argument. Two no. that's a no true that is the same as saying no true Scotsman puts sugar in their porridge. And three yeah. And this is consider consider this. Let's let's go back to when Mass Effect wasn't shit, and okay. the the attachment the, the attachment that people had with the journey the journey of the Shepherd that they had made, and and subsequently why the backlash when three came along was so, was so was so vociferous was partially due to that attachment. When you're giving me the Oh, it's not a true role-playing experience. You're essentially invalidating the connection that they had with that version of Shepard that they built. And and the other the other things people don't realize is uh, computers computer GMs never feel like they're out to fuck you because their girlfriend refused to blow them before the game. <laughs> and I mean, yeah, and I I know I know some will make some will make the argument of. Well, well, you're st you're still go you're still going along a you're still going along a script in a in a video game. You're not freely making your your own decisions. And I'm, I'm like, you're going to be doing that with a GM anyway. There's the reason why the why, why the referee, game master, dungeon master, whatever you want to call them, is do is um is all, is all, it has a director analogy as much as a referee or judge analogy. Yeah. Well, here's a funny thing. You know, I mentioned before I play it. I have played everything from Shadowrun to Twilight 2000. You know, but we played Twilight 2000 while in Germany in the Fold Gap. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> that was fun. But uh, we actually played ourselves. But anyway, uh, when I brought in the group, when I brought in the new group to uh, Riffs, actually, when I started playing, period, with them, what, uh, they asked if we were going to do D&D 5e, and I was like, no, we're going to use the original Pathfinder because I have all the original Pathfinder books, and I don't like 5e. Uh, I, I, think I, I, think 5e. I, was on, I think I was on with one of the campaigns you were doing with Pathfinder. Yeah, and uh, 
what startled people, and I know you saw it, the biggest problem uh, new players had was I'd kick back in my chair and go, okay, what do you want to do? What do you want your characters to do today? And you could almost hear the dial tone. Mm. And, you know, it, people would be like, well, um, can I go pit fight in one of the taverns and get money? Yeah, sure. And it just startled people when he moved to Rifts because you can – because we were laughing about it last night. In Rifts, in Rifts – well, in D&D, your character's traveling 150 miles. You're looking at two weeks to a month of being able to move and with monster attacks and everything else. In Rifts, going 150 miles is like four, five, four or five hours of driving if you're going overland. <laughs> and it really takes people to uh a little bit to get that into your head into their head that i play a lot of open world where it's like okay what do you guys want to do you know, okay you came to a crossroads uh this is what the signs say you know what, can we tell where we are no not yet <clears throat> the stars haven't come out no gps which way do you want to go and they're like you know what let's see where the hell petticoat junction goes <laughs> And it blows people away because they're so used to modules and the GM going, no, you can't do that. 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 And video games that when you really give them the open world, which was what was I've always loved about tabletop, is uh, it blows their mind. And I don't know. I don't know where I was going with this. I was going somewhere, but then I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I'm not. I'm not saying. I'm not saying that you can have the same experience in one. In one medium to to the other, but I do I do feel that there is a certain segment of pe of people within within the f fan base community, whatever you want to call it, that ha that um re that rely way too much on a um pu on a purity standard, and this idea this idea of this idea of you of um if somebody if somebody came in from the, from those pe from those particular um, ty types of um, video game backgrounds that they're somehow yeah. lesser and I'm like Stanley once said every comic is someone's first and yes. I do think that philosophy can apply just as much to um, tabletop games which is the reason why I've got I've gotten on some games that I feel are too user unfriendly um if I had to give one recent example, it would probably be when I covered Traveler 5 and I tried to review it in my usual style and it just devolved into me bitching about the way the presentation looks like the you looks like the owner's manual for the, for your car that you don't read. <laughs> uh, yeah. The big thing I found... Oh, crap. I lost again. Sorry. You know, I woke up like an hour and a half ago. But... Uh, <laughs> uh, can't remember what we're talking about now. <laughs> but uh. it, you know this this idea that this, there seems to be this idea that tabletop games should not be drawing inspiration from um, MMOs from from video games oh, or whatnot. Bullshit. And bullshit. I do, I find I find it I find it bullshit because and this was something I said right around the time Tome of Battle came out, and I think I've been validated with time. You're going to be dealing with a whole generation of people for whom their introduction to fantasy was not the works of Moorcock, was not the works of Tolkien, was not the works of um, Howard. Their or introduction the, to fantasy was Harry Potter. May, it may have been Harry Potter. It may it may have been a, anime like The Slayers. It may have World of Warcraft. Mm -hmm. and, the, and some of them. From that, from that supermajority, are going to are going to be inspired by what they see and want to and want to make their own games. Yes. And some of those games will be tabletop games, and they're going to draw from that. And there, and um, I'd like I'd like to, and given some of the stuff I've covered over the last five years that I've been doing interviews, and have and have like seven hundred plus in, plus interviews on under my belt. I think I've been I think I've been validated on th on that particular prediction I made in the early two thousands. Well, Toma Battle, the biggest people who were screaming about Toma Battle, it's funny Toma Battle comes out right. Mm -hmm. I bought I don't remember that much about it because fuck it was twenty years ago. I do. But uh, Toma Battle comes out, and it has all this stuff for martial fighters, 
and everybody starts screaming anime bullshit and power creep. When the Toma Battle was released, there were four books at least. I think there was more. I think there was like a dozen books for spellcasters alone. Every this, see, this is the thing that gets me about D and D. Wasn't there an a, Wasn't there an A to Z series of series of just spells? Yes, I did one. I did actually. I did four. I wrote four die twenty books based just spells. But uh, there was this huge thing where all these people are crying because the marshals got a book for a change. And literally, if you open, pick, grab any any source book out there. It doesn't matter if it says on the cover the big book of fighter stuff. There will be 40 pages of mage spells in there. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's uh, Kenders of the Undersea Apocalypse. There will be 40 pages of overpowered mage spells. But, oh, they released something for fighters and paladins and rangers. Oh, d d is over. The world is coming to an end. Oh, why do these people have to have superhuman abilities? Fuck you, Hercules wrestled a river. <laughs> You know, See, that Hercules, was my other bitch. Don't don't get, and don't even get me started on some on some of the crazy um, physical feats that you see in Irish myth. <laughs> yeah, you know, and I brought that up. I was like, so let me get this right. Hercules can wrestle a river. Uh, all the other demigods, you know, which player characters are demigods. Mm -hmm. I mean, by sixth level, they have powers not known to mortals. And you want to tell me that? Having my allowing the fighter to wrestle a water elemental who is the manifestation of the river to get the river to quit flooding the farmland is bullshit. While you know, you've got you've got a spell list that might as well be a fucking rule book because nobody will control your spell how many spells you gather up. Go fuck yourself. I got so sick of that shit. And it was terrible on N World, who is who God for the longest time N World was like the biggest hub of scum and villainy out there. Who all of them were trying to push their own fucking agendas and try? Oh, we we need to make it. And you know, and I'm gonna call it something awful. Back in the day, something awful had this thing of, oh, that's the last thing we need in our hobby when someone would put, talk about their game. It's not your fucking well, hobby. Is my is my yeah. response? Yeah, they were always like that. And it's like, oh, having these marshals be able to do stuff is bullshit and power creep. It's like. You were just bragging that you built a character that at 6th level could do a 15 die 6 fireball 8 times a day. Go fuck yourself. It's like, as soon as marshals get something, their butthole slams shut. I mean, it's just fucking annoying. And, again, we, we, you look at... It, the, the, thing that I, the thing that I find funny re regarding that... Is you look in 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 various in various forms of media, and you don't you you see people doing these larger than life feats that that aren't related to magic, and that's not a problem. Or you have you have cases like what we see in um in su in super in superhero comics. You don't even have to go that far. Watch any action movie, and if you know anything about how real-world physics works and how the human body works, your average action hero is dead in the first 30 minutes of the movie. You know, if, I'm sorry, if you if somebody is pick, kicked hard enough that they fly 10 feet and hit a pillar with the middle of their back 8 feet off the ground, he was dead when the kick ruptured all his internal organs. So talking about, oh, you know, this is unbelievable – you just sat here and watched a movie where some guy with karate outfought 15 dudes with two by fours. Get the fuck out. <laughs> Sorry. But I'll tell you another reason. There's so why many are you spells. apologizing about swearing? I'm going to, I'm going to let you in on a secret. You want to know why there's so many spells in these books? This is coming from a design. This is coming from a game designer with over 15 years of experience. You want to know why there's so many spells in those books? Why? Spells are the basic bitch easiest stuff to make ever that don't even have to be roughly balanced. I've been saying that for years. That's the big secret. That's why, you know, everybody's like, oh, I released a book with with 150 spells. Well, big fucking deal. In 2002, I was one of the first ones to release a, a, a book, and it had 500 spells in it. And it was, you know, holy shit. Spells are the easiest, most basic bitch stuff to create. They really are. I mean, mm -hmm. from a design point of view, they're yeah. not that hard. And the th 
the Oh god, and remember when the original thing was oh it's it's what it is is it's magic missile, but it's ice. Oh, okay. It's a fireball, but it's necromatic energy. Okay, I've been doing that since, you know, eighty five. What's your fucking point? I have yeah. I have um I've pushed for the longest time to have to instead of having spell lists even even though the project I'm working on technically has one, to ha to have instead a spell creation system. Yeah, where you could do it on the flight. There was a game that had that. Oh, there's there's been uh, plenty there's been plenty of that have that. Yeah, where you you know you put so many po magic points in range and then area of effect and then damage type and then damage dice. And then number of well damage dice type and number of dice and mm -hmm. whether it's persistent or not. And uh, yeah, um, you, Alpha you, you, Omega you're, you're... did Alpha Omega did it. Um, I'm pretty I'm pretty sure. Some... <coughs> Gerps is the only one I knew who had a point system for magic. Yeah, my wife just said Gerps is the only one she knew that had a point system. Yeah, but for Ger magic. yeah, but Gerps has a point system for fucking everything. Yes. <laughs> but the thing. The big reason, the big reason I've always argued that, as well as well as a system to create um, custom monsters, is the ones that you've got listed are only going to go so far. When somebody's like, "Oh my, oh my book has th has three hundred spells," I'm like, "Yeah, and how many of those actually get you actually get used on a regular basis?" Yeah, that's the other thing. You know, they bitch people who people who play wizards all the time bitch when a book comes out. One book comes out about marshals, and you look and. The only thing they do is they go through the other <laughs> books and they just pick out the one – no matter what characters they're playing, they go for certain spells out of those books. And it's always high damage, no save, good range, lowest level they can get away with. It's always the fucking same. Casters, people – so many people – I found this out in – it starting it, – it got really bad starting about 2008 that casters became the laziest motherfuckers out there. Mm -hmm. I mean, they'd be like, oh, well, you do is swing a sword. Motherfucker, the last eight combats, you've used the same exact spell, and you use your spells for one encounter and then demand we take a 12-hour rest. That's the other thing DMs do, is they let the fucking party rest too often. And I've, um, I've mentioned this before, but I have never been a fan of the Vancey, of the Vancean model of spell charges and, ha only, and having to do the whole rest eight hours to get your spells back. I became a fan of it when I started really fucking being like, no, no, your character can't go out and drink. You had one encounter. You can either push forward with very little spells or you can go rest and the party will keep doing what they're doing. I started laying that down and I became a real fan of Ancy and Magic because it's like, let's have a, let's have a little bit of, uh, of resource management. Instead of, oh, we got in a fight, I used my big spell, now we all have to rest for 12 hours. We know the orcs are going to be in the pass in three days, and it's two days of marching, and we need to get, and we need to be able to dig in. Oh, we'll just rest this one 12 hour, and then the party's late. You know, the orcs march through and burn the fucking town because the wizard is like, oh, I used another spell. We need to rest for 12 hours. How about we just leave your ass behind, Mr. Magic? Yeah. I think, I think part of the reason I'm, I know, I, Part of the reason I'm not a big I'm not a big fan of it is there isn't in mo in most settings that use it there isn't a narrative justification for it being used and I know some people I know some people are like it's why why is that a big deal well let's look at some let's look at some other games you have the, you have the whole spell burn th thing in Shadowrun and I love the reason, that and the reason for it is very simple using magic is a very taxing affair you're gonna get tired. You, will, you blow you will... your drain roll and your. I I saw somebody threw a first uh, basically the equivalent of magic missiles power dart. They blew their drain roll with all ones, and he looked and went. Apparently, my character just had a grand mal seizure and shit himself. Yeah. <laughs> um. In in so, in something <coughs> in something like Legend of the Five Rings, yeah. you're not casting the spell yourself. You're asking the kami to perform a service for you. Yes. In in no, uh, hell, even even in the even in the Dying Earth RPG, which you think would use this system, since it's called the Vancian model, yeah. it doesn't use it. No, you, it doesn't. It barely even uses magic in the in the traditional sense. You have that. You have a tier system, 
with how it, with how it works. And and even th and even then, it's not a it's not a guarantee. the the way th the way that things work in the Dying Earth RPG is actually very is very interesting, and it's one of those things I, d I don't want to summarize without um without t without um completely tripping over myself. But the fact of the matter is, in fiction, if you're if you're do if you're introducing a magic system in a f in a f in a fictional setting. You have to establish the rules and b and boundaries for how for how it works, otherwise ma otherwise you literally have no limit with what you can do with magic. This is something any any writing workshop mm -hmm. or any writing teacher is going to beat into your damn head. So why is it a magical exception when it comes to fantasy role playing games when it shouldn't be? Is the question I've always asked. Like what? Wh like I've always asked why do I need to. Why, in universe, does my character need to have these spells memorized? What is the reason for it? And the and I've never been given a straight answer. And the same thing go the same thing goes with say and say the eight hour say the eight hour rest thing. If why is it why is it that the character needs it? And I know some I know some will say. This is a this is a game this is a game not a, not a not a novel. Why is why why do you make such a big deal out of it? Because that be, because immersion is still important. If I'm try, if I'm trying to bring people <coughs> into this world, then keep, then having then having the means to immerse them in it so that those questions can be answered is important. Yeah, that's all. That's always I, been my philosophy. You know what I've been doing lately when I when I run a D and D game for about the past six seven years. Well, why does the magic work like this? You don't know because it's fucking magic. One thing that D and D three did. I had my doubts during the design phase, but you know, I was I was a nobody freelancer, and uh, I was a nobody. Still am now. Well, I'm a nobody again, which is nice. But uh, one of the big things I didn't like was it codified and industrialized magic to the point where, let's be honest, if the magic rules worked in a world the way it works in the 3.0, 4.0, and 5.0 books, they would be approximately at... Uh, people would have industrialized that shit so fast. It would have been... They would have industrialized... It would have been like the Industrial Revolution once the rules of magic were figured out. Because in D and D, magic always does the same thing every single time, and there are always, you know, I mean, the meta magic and then the classes that let you break all the normal limitations. It's gotten to the point where it's damn near industrialized. I mean, if you get a pair of magic boots, you know, it's just fuck. <laughs> it's just. Pardon me, but I know exactly how this this will work every single time, no matter what. And you know, there was kind of a neat thing about Wild Magic when it first came out, you know, because it was magic hmm. instead of what it's because you know, yeah, first edition, second edition had that problem, but first and second edition had a lot of stuff for the DM to use that altered magic and made it magic. And people are like, well, you need to have a narrative reason. No, I don't. It's fucking magic. Okay, I don't have to explain tits. It's magic, mm -hmm. and people get so reading about that. I think th I think when it comes to the it, the it's magic, there's it's um, it's very it's very much a pendulum. You can go too f you can go too far the other way where you're using that as a bandage to explain e to explain everything, and you can and you can go the over industrialized w way. Whichever whatever side, if you go too far to the left or to the right, the problem is you've gone too far. Um, yeah. Because I, I re I've obviously, obviously, some, de some, some degree of mystery when it comes to magic sh should be should be utilized. But this is this is also why I'm in fi why I'm in favor of instead of a codified spell list, a spell creation system, so that so that there's a bit more control when it comes to that. Uh, there's. There was um, there there's a, there's been a few there's been a few five E settings that have that have made some interesting um head headway in that, 
and and one system that was used in 5e and Pathfinder known as the, known as the spheres system yeah. um, spheres uh. of power and um, spheres of might uh, more recently they expand they expanded on it with spheres of guile as well as champions of the spheres for the in between archetypes that's for Pathfinder 2e isn't it no no um path it well. was originally done in Pathfinder 1e they did a 5e conversion, but the bulk of it Which is book in Pathfinder. Was that? Oh, no, that was, that's a third-party one. That's right. Or... Yeah. That was done by Drop Dead Studios, who, in full disclosure, I've interviewed on multiple occasions. And um, it is more of, it's more of a talent-based system. Yeah. And one of, the things that, one of the things that helped put it over the top for me is, for one, um, spellcasting is, is not specifically tied to one ability score. It's one. It's one that's chosen whenever a casting tradition is built. Casting traditions right. are essentially setting the rules for how magic is supposed to work. So, if if say you need to you need to write out a bunch of runes on solid ground, that'd be a casting tradition. If you need to spit, if you need to cut yourself and spill blood on the on the ground or it, or in the air to in, to entreat some extra dimensional being, that's it. That's a casting tradition. And the attrib the chosen attribute, well, it can be one of the three mental ones, you know, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. But I've frequently house ruled it that the physical ones can be used as well because, damn it, I want muscle wizards. <laughs> yeah. I want I want somebody who cast who casts fireball by flexing like he like he's at the Arnold yeah. Classic. <laughs> I even I even went so far with it that I, that I had one character who was nothing more than a um, knockoff of Hans and Franz from SNL. <laughs> yeah, I had somebody in Pathfinder play a Pathfinder one. They they they, they put their stats because I, I was like, you guys want to do roll? You want to do stat array? I'm like, oh, let's do chat, stat array this time. And they put their second highest stat in in a uh, in strength. And the third highest stat in Constitution, and I was like, you know, normally people do uh, dexterity. Goes, I don't care what normal people do, and he he put points in intimidation, and I'm like, okay. And the first time, because we're playing a city campaign, mm -hmm. and the first time he was going to use his magic, he rips his shirt off and flexes and does an intimidate roll, and then starts casting. He's like, and he's like, I want to make sure my casting is all about flexing my muscles. I'm like, oh my god, you're Major Armstrong from Full Metal Alchemist, and they go, yes, exactly. I'm like. You know what? I can roll with this. You know, mm -hmm. I can find. Tear your shirt off, and there's all these sparkles erupt around you, and you start casting, and the flowers drift down. He's like, "This rules." And then when he beat the guy, he's all like, "Of course I won. You just cast spells. I do it with style, grace, and panache." I'm like, "Yeah, you're getting extra. <laughs> you're getting extra XP for this shit." <laughs> um, but to use to use an, the way these I call I I call these spheres a collection of talent trees, but it's not. The necessarily linked talent trees, like like say what you'd see out of Diablo two, you pick a you would pick a sphere and you're you can and ev at every level you can either pick a sphere or a talent within a sphere that you already have. That sphere gives you a bit gives you a base power. And I'll I'll use des I'll use destruction as my example for this because every everybody loves a blaster caster. <laughs> yes. Um, right out of the gate you get destructive blast. You can use that as a range as a ranged attack as a standard action. It deals a number of d6s based based on your level, starting at one d6 at first, and at twenty fifth it's thirteen d6. You can you can um, you can you do get spell points based on your level, but spell points aren't used to cast spells; they're used to enhance them. Uh, and through talents within the destruction sphere, you can do other stuff besides just a single target. Um, spell, because because no, normally it just does um physical one of the three physical damage types. If you wanted yeah. to do, if you wanted to do say, um force damage, well that that there's a talent for that. If you want to have it where it's a chain where it's um using chain instead instead of single target, you know like chain lightning, that that uh -huh. is its own talent. And not all of these not all of these cost um spell points to use that version of it taking um adhesive blast which turns it which turns the destructive blast into acid um that just that just means that it, do, it does acid damage instead of um physical and anyone who fails reflex get um is entangled 
That's all. That's all that that does. What was it? Acid. Bla- uh, what was it? I uh, basically web mixed with acid blast to watch them just get caught in it and dissolve. <laughs> I mean, you you can you can do. It's not. It's not like you have to. When it comes to bla- when it comes to blast type, when it comes to the subtypes, there's blast types and blast shapes. You you can't you cannot do more than one type and more than one shape. But once you've gotten a few of e- a few of each, you can do crazy ass combinations. Because for in- for instance, there's the chain effect. So imagine imagine that same acid blast I mentioned, but it's having the it's having the chain effects that chain lightning does. You know, if there's another yeah. if there's another target in range, you keep hitting them until you run out. <laughs> you know, so so imagine now all of them failing that reflex save in the, in the same sense. Nice. Uh, or um, or at or instead of using the usual shape, use something like guided strike, where you spend a spell point to give it to give the blast a. Tw- a bonus of twenty. <laughs> it costs okay. a spell point. And those spell points aren't cheap, but if you really want to make sure you hit, that's one way to do it. <laughs> uh, or, That'll do it. Or inst- or instead have it that in- in- instead of being a um ins- instead of being a single target um, blast, have it that it's a um it's an aura effect around you. You know, the range of five feet plus another five for eat for 10 caster levels um the de- the downside is the damage is minimized but it's a aura that hits anybody around you <laughs> you know the the fact that the fact that you can use that talent system to come up with a bunch of crazy combinations is why i keep endorsing the spheres system yeah and an ex they all they also do some dumb stuff on on occasion like as an April Fool's joke they had a bear sphere with um with bear, with um bear characteristics <laughs> like I said it was an April Fool's joke and the thing and is still... the the sphere actually works yeah now, as long as it works who cares I mean <sighs> um. Eventually, they did a martial equivalent with spheres of might. Um, the same same kind of sphere system, but instead of a instead of using spell points, it uses what's called martial focus, and that martial focus is a on or off switch. You either have it or you don't. Yeah. Some things generate it, and some things spend it. Uh, and it relies on that same thing of getting a bit, getting a couple. A couple of base actions, and then, exp- and then expanding further. Uh, some of some of them will have some of them will have multiple options. Some of them will only have sing- single ones. Most recently, they expanded into a skill-based affair with spheres of guile. Neat. Uh, and i've al- I've always said that the third party is where the real fun happens when it comes to any sort of d20 equivalent I've spoken in the past about how much I loved fantasy craft for having a much better understanding of how to utilize feats than d than d and d and Pathfinder do because they're organized into categories so you don't have to finagle about whether or not this whether or not a new feat is counts as a fighter bonus feat or not. You know, instead, instead, you instead the well, they don't have the fighter class in in fantasy craft. They have the soldier class, but the whenever the soldier gets a bonus feat, it lists off what categories count. So if somebody wants to if somebody wants to homebrew new feats, they can put a category in and yeah. don't have to worry about that. Oh, well, it's like once again you get back with, with feats in Pathfinder and uh, and D and D. Uh, I don't know how many times I've looked in a book, and you know it's supposed to be a martial book, and I look in there, and two thirds of the feats are dedicated to mages, and it's like, are you fucking kidding me? Yeah, I'm, I remember. I remember when I I remember when I picked up Complete Warrior, and I'm like, why is there a half caster in here? And I'm referring to the Blade yes. Singer. Of course, yeah. the bigger question is, I want I want to know what drugs people were on when they built that samurai class in that book. Ugh. That was that was. 
The only yeah. the only dumber thing I've seen done with Samurai was what the 5e DM's guide claim said when they claimed that you could reskin a pa reskin a paladin to play as a um, samurai. Well, you know that they did that in second edition and it worked. Well, first first edition and it worked. But I, I guess it's the play styles were different back then. Um, <laughs> even even back then, I I wouldn't have I wouldn't have been a fan. I I wouldn't have I wouldn't have been a huge fa I wouldn't have been a huge fan of it. Um, uh, I'm I'm not I'm not saying that it, that a that the samurai archetype has to be a um has has to be a has to be this half mystical th thing. I'm not I'm not taking that route. Not unless not unless yeah. I want to. I should say. Truth be truth be told, I've I've. I think I think doing I think both samurai and knight should be more should be more specializations. I've always been of the approach that you should have the the class as the equivalent of high school and a specialization that's the equivalent of college. If I'm making any sense. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, you because. Know, one of the the problem the problem with say the fi the fighter is that there's not a whole lot you can, there's not a whole lot you can really do to establish a playstyle beyond good with weapons but that's so that's so broad that what you how you can make them mechanically interesting when it comes to being good with weapons is limited plus that plus that whole thing of oh, oh of um oh you can use any weapon well most people aren't going. Most people aren't going to be a walking arsenal. Yeah. You know they're go they're gonna they're gonna pick a small handful f handful of styles of how they equip their character and largely stick to it, even if even if we're not factoring in proficiency rules. Which I've always held. I like I, I like proficiency. I really mm -hmm. enjoyed proficiency rules. I still like them. Mm -hmm. I, I like what them, got but me I was the arguments against them. Hmm? The arguments. Well, I would. Well, I want my wizard to be able to pick up a sword if he has to. Well, you know, fuck off. <laughs> um, I've always, t I've always taken the approach. Uh, the approach I always, t I always ended up taking when it came to proficiencies is, oh, you anybody can equip anything, but the but the f but for so if you want that wizard to pick up a sword, oh, he can. You're just gonna have to deal with the fact that the fighter is gonna be better at it than you. Yeah. There's nothing. I'm not going to penalize you, but I'm not going to give you bonus. But I'm not going to give you bonuses for it. Is the right. is the approach instead of? I I never was a fan of um the idea of the idea of proficiency penalties or no, or non skill or non skill penalties. Instead instead ju instead just stumps just with. My approach has been that the the fact that they're not getting any bonuses should be enough of a penalty. Yeah. I like the penalty because I like the penalty. Mm -hmm. um, my God, it's just it fits with my style yeah. of the Emmy. The other thing is, is I will tell you another place that I argued against it and was, you know, ultimately, uh, ultimately told to shut the fuck up. But I still think that giving people other than the marshals multiple attacks per round was a huge mistake. I could see the argument for the rogue, but not for everyone else. And I also thought that the. Uh, the amount of multiple, the uh, how fast the multiple attacks came and how terrible the bonuses were, uh, really made it so that they were like, oh well, the fighter gets multiple attacks. Well, yeah, but that negative five and then negative ten on his second and third attack, he might as well not even fucking have them. And oh uh, god. Yeah, and I I will terrible. note I will note when it came to feats, one of the other problems I had was some of the prerequisites with, with certain feats were excessive. Whirlwind yeah. Attack has been my whipping boy for about for about twenty years for that reason. Whirlwind Attack, it just never seemed to. I don't know. Just because because the the amount of prereqs that it that it has makes it yeah, so that it you just... have to plan ahead several levels in advance, and it creates a false choice effect. And it was very underwhelming, and it didn't scale. Well, that that was the other thing. Marshall's Marshall stuff didn't scale. Period. Like you, your your fighter I, doing a long your fighter doing an attack with a long sword is going to do the same is is going to do the same d six damage at first level that it does at twentieth. 
I did make things scale, and I still remember, you know, I was, they were like, you know, one of the fight, a new player joined, and you know, one of the players was like, yeah, you know, I'm taking toughness with this fighter, and he's like, oh, ha, ha, it's only three hit points. And he looked, and the guy looks and goes, no, it's three hit points extra per level, and only marshals get that bonus. A wizard gets. The well, where's that? The rule books, and I said. I'm a game designer. I've been designing stuff. I'm doing some freelance stuff for uh, Watsy. So uh, it's in there because I say it's in there. Yeah. Uh, and f I, d I double checked what the prereqs for Whirlwind Attack was. And there's a reason why, I, why I'm harsh on, th on this feed in particular that I'll, that I'll get to in a minute. But you needed Dex 13, Intelligence 13, which is odd for both of them because those are two attributes you're not going to be using. <laughs> Combat expertise, dodge, mobility, spring attack, and BAB of four. Jeez. Oh, mobility and spring attack are your killers. Good good feats, but... <sighs> yeah, been a... good feats, but, I mean, the way you've got to stack that up is just ridiculous. Mm-hmm. The, and, and what's fucked up is I actually called Monty Cook out on this when they were designing uh, D and D. I actually said, "Hey, you know these feats are worthless," and he's like, "Well, it's if they had system mastery, they'd know this." And I'm like, "Yeah, but nobody's got system mastery because this is an entirely new game system." It's well, there's of, reasons for it. Yeah, it's that whole system mastery, six system ignorance, ivory tower thing. It's it's kind of it's kind of funny that I didn't that I don't see any of that in the cipher system, which has been the most recent thing that Cooks put out. Yeah. Oh. I I haven't bought any of his new stuff. I mean, he's an okay guy. He's he's a decent person. But uh, I don't I didn't really buy his stuff when he. I still remember when he, he when he left Wizards and he was and he did his own company. He was releasing his new game. And he wanted a hundred and ten dollars for the book, <laughs> and I was like, "Are you fucking crazy?" <laughs> I just get I just got on um, Onyx Path's case for the fact that the Abyssal's book that they're kickstarting right now, or rather, putting on Indiegogo, for the physical book they want one thirty. Like, fuck off. Yeah, it's like the that's like when they came out with that uh, comprehensive Psionics book. If you wanted a copy, it was $110 in 2009. Mm -hmm. It's like, no. Although, speaking of psionics, I, have, I haven't finished this, but there's been a, an idea that I've been kicking in my head because I wanted to explore why it's been so damn hard for people to do psionics in a way that isn't stupid. And I think, I think part, of, part of the problem is that psion they end up building psionics as just another form of caster. And something... Yeah. There was the there was the mental combat thing that was tried in the early days, and well, there's the reason that didn't stick around. Uh, what's funny is if you read the rules and got familiar with them from the back of the player's handbook and in the DMG, it actually was kind of fun, you know. Kind of fun, but you know, kind of situational. Well, you yeah, it, you had to you had to add in you had to add in psionic powers to the creatures that would have psionic powers. Like mm -hmm. mind flayers, you know. But yeah. I don't know. It could be because I played a lot of fucking D and D, mm -hmm. and I mean, we're talking. When I'm talking, I played a lot of D and D, first edition AD and D. Um, we're talking play on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and during the summers, we'd play every evening because fuck, it was hot, mm -hmm. and uh, it, just something to do, something to do, mm -hmm. and. uh so we integrated pretty much. I mean, at one, we pretty much integrated everything. We started playing around with, uh, with modding the game with, uh, with house rules. We started playing around with those in like '84, and you know, so the, there wasn't that. I want to say that monster that uh, Fiend Folio was out. When we started modding, but I'm not quite. Don't remember if we were or not. But anyway, it was a long time ago, and. We just started doing little things, and we had a lot of fun. Hmm. And uh, crap, I forgot where I was going again. I'm still waking up. Uh, yeah. The the big thing was was in modding it. We tried to make the game more fun. That's like all this big fucking thing with online with. Oh, if you mod the game at all, you're not playing the game. What 
game it's meant to be. I got an idea. How about you sit at your table where nobody else plays, and I'll sit at my table where people pl- where people actually drive 15 miles to come to my house and play. How about if we do that? Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, altering the game has always been a core function. Uh, damn, I forgot what we were talking about. Yeah, speed chains I mean, how, traps. Uh, yeah, the... Okay. Uh... The reason why I bring the reason why I pick on whirlwind attack in the way that I do oh, yeah. is I've had I've for for most for most of the time that I've been playing I've been I have done I've tried to teach people who have more of a video background in t- in um in the 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 possibilities within tabletop and of course when, of course people people coming in with a video background one of that video is going to be the legend of zelda and of co- of course one of the traditions in that game has always been that spin attack that you've seen in every zelda game since a link to the past and i have never really played that it's it's based it's basically a th- it's basically a 360 um spit um sword slash and for me for me if somebody if somebody's coming in with that background, obviously I'd want to I'd want to present certain archetypes or certain build as saying it's something similar to what they already know, you know, to to help e- to help ease in on the process. But if but because of that because of the restrictions w- when it comes to getting something like whirlwind attack, they're not going to be able to do that out of the out of the gate unless I'm do- unless I'm playing at a higher level out out of the gate, yeah. which is kind of. Kind of um, ca- kind of counterintuitive to what I'm trying to do when bringing in a bunch of newcomers, and that's why I f- that's why that thing is so is some is something that I'm the that I'm so harsh on. I think whirlwind attack had a well, lots of stuff has problems. I mean. Mm-hmm. It, it there but, is a bit there is a bit of an issue when people act when people act like there isn't a problem. Yeah. Or the or that the or that um or that there's a certain way you're supposed to do things when even Gygax didn't have that attitude from everything I've seen and read. No, no, and, and when he was on N World, you know, he was he was pretty cool about things. I mean, you know, people would talk about the mods he did, and a lot of times he'd find them interesting. Mm-hmm. And what gets me is, you know, these fucking people online, oh, you're not supposed to mod the rules at all. And it's like, have you ever seen the original rate? I actually asked one of them. Okay, you're such Mr. Expert. You've been playing since back in night. According to your bio, you've been playing since AD&D since 1976. You say that the core rulebook shouldn't be modified at all. No, they shouldn't because they're, you know, if you want to play the way Gygax intended. All right. What about, uh, th- what about uh, Through the Magic Mirror? Or what about the Wonderland modules? They don't count. <laughs> what about Ravenloft? Oh well, that's that was under no 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 rules is written. What about Ravenloft? Well, that's campaign setting. That's different. And rate and I love this. Ravenloft didn't modify the rules that much anyway. Bullshit. <laughs> and for those of you listening that you know may or may not know, you want to see a spellcaster player shit themselves. Take them to take them to the old black back app ah, black box set of Ravenloft. Not this shitty new. We want to pretend we're gothic vampires, but we're not. Why we go back to the old box and look at what happens to the spells? Holy shit! Where mate where people who played mages were like, this you know this place sucks, but at the same time it's so great because you know you're detect evil. Yeah, you're not finding out shit. Or it might give you false positives just because that's funny. Your uh, your detect magic may or may not work. I mean, <clears throat> but you tell them that, and they're like, "Well, that's different." I'm so fucking sick of that. That's different. That no, 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 no. You can't. You that can't. is. Are you familiar with special pleading? Because that's what they're doing with that. Yeah. My favorite thing is I was like, "So you don't use anybody's home rules at all?" No, I don't. I said, uh, "I'm looking over your shoulder." And uh, do you use that book right there? And he, which one? I told him which one. He's like, oh, yes, it's actually one of the books I mainly use for my campaign. And it's really important. Uh, yeah, it, it's a big deal. And we use it rules as written. I said, so you don't play anybody's homebrew rules? Well, I don't do any. I was like, well, that's funny. 
because that's my homebrew rules you're holding in your hand right fucking now. <laughs> oh. Well, I don't see your name on them. Well, mm-hmm. I actually, I actually did something when I work for, when I work for companies. One of my big things is the only place my name appears is in the personnel files and the project files that are in company mm-hmm. and on my paycheck. You don't put my name in the book. You don't put my name in the thank you section. You don't put my name in the contributor. My name does not belong on that book any way, shape, or form. <clears throat> you paid me. I took my money. I went away. <laughs> the whole you p- you pay a hoe to leave? Yep. That's how, that's how I approach freelancing, and that's why I got so much work. Because everybody else danced around with, oh, I'm doing stuff for Woods of the Coast. Ask me, you know, ask me this, ask me that, and oh, I'll talk to you about that. And they went to me and were like, hey, Ralts, uh, you want to, might, you want to help on this book? Yeah, sure. What are we doing? This is what we're doing. All right, I'll submit some stuff and uh, give me four days. Mm-hmm. That was the other thing. You see my horrific output when it comes to just sitting down and working. Yeah. I mean, I'd be. Everybody else would still be like, well, I'm trying to figure. out. I'm like, done. Well, we need three prestige classes and four advanced class. Done. <laughs> and they'd be like, "Wow, you know, what? Do you, how do you want your name to be listed on my paycheck?" <laughs> yeah. Okay. And... Uh, we guess you won't be on there. Mm-hmm. No, no, you better not put me on the con- contributors or copy. Nothing. You don't put me anywhere. Mm-hmm. Not even on the copyright because you hired me to make this. It's yours. If you hire me to come into your house and build your fireplace, yeah, I don't. I don't put my name on it. I don't show up at your house to show your fireplace off. <laughs> you paid your money. I left. <laughs> nope. Whenever, whenever, whenever people do that whole "oh, I don't use any house rules at all. I pl- I play it the way Gagax intended." I'm like, I'm sure. Th- find me one person who who will pl- who will say that they play Uno exactly as written, and I'll show yeah. you a liar. <laughs> I mean, did we did we did I ever play second edi- first and second edition as written? Yes. A lot of time when I'm bringing in new players, mm-hmm. new players especially, this is critical for you play it as as written, mm-hmm. so that when they buy the book, it isn't a waste of money and they yeah. don't feel like they waste their time. Especially, you, you know, some, there's always there's always been people who. Oh, well, player design their design their games as if they're still designing for their table. Yes. Or you've got the people that design their stuff as if, you know, if you want to write a novel, write a fucking novel, okay? If you want to do an interactive story, set it up with your players beforehand. Because sometimes it's nice to get on the train and look at the scenery as you go by. It's really nice. Other times, now fuck that, I want to get off the train and go driving. I want to go, mu- and today, I don't want to go driving on the road say I want to go muddy. But, you know, so many people write their shit as if – you're right – as if they're sitting at their own table with their own players, and it shows. Yeah, when, when you do that, you, ha- you end up having a game that is only going to be for that, per- that particular group and yeah. not for a general um, a- audience. And I don't, I don't mean to, when I say general audience, I don't intend on that to be like some wider audience, um, gobbledygook or some, or some shit like that. But the fact of the, but again, going back to that whole, every game is, is somebody's first. Yes. That's what, that's why the present, that's why I get so harsh on the presentation issues that you see in, that you, that you see in Palladium or in, or in, um, or in other games. Cause I guarantee if, if, um. If somebody, did, if you did the exact same system, but just cleaned it up, which is what Rift's Ultimate Edition was supposed to fucking be, <laughs> that it was and, supposed to be that, and it created a whole bunch of new problems. Yes, it did. Well, at least they got rid of Dump Clip, because Dump Clip was a problem. A prob- a problem, but the, uh, although um, I think ar- I think around that time, <laughs> Simbeta thought Simbeta thought he had he had um. He had str- he had struck it he had struck it rich or struck gold with the video game adaptation on the fucking end cage. No no no, D- uh, dump clip was in the original mm-hmm. riffs book, and I think it only took I'd have to look it up. It only took like two attacks. Mm-hmm. So if you had a guy with with like six attacks, it was very much in your fucking uh, advantage to do dump clip, swap your mag, dump clip, swap your mag. Yeah. And he should have made it a full round action where at the end of the at the end of the round you you have an empty magazine. Mm-hmm. 
Oh, I remember. I remember playing Space Hulk, and while you could, while you could certainly, um, you could certainly sit back and and shoot with with over doing Overwatch. Um, every time you fired, you run the risk of jamming. Yeah. The, well, the problem with the problem with uh, Sabita, and it was a big one, is he fell in love with the Vietnam stats without understanding them. His big one that he even quotes in his books is the study of Vietnam, where they where they figured out that for every round, for every I think it was like 137 rounds fired, one hit. What he didn't know, because I I've read that same report, I've gone over that report because I worked in ordinance. I looked. I looked, God, I hate that report. Because it's it's a stack of it's I think it's like four hundred pages. He took one sentence out of it. What he forgot to look at was that included the M60, the Modus, the Puff the Magic Dragon, uh, helicopter door gunners. It didn't take. He claimed it was for the riflemen, and that wasn't true. He claimed it was just for riflemen because that's why he's like, well, that's why physical prowess doesn't matter. Physical prowess matters a fuck ton. But uh, that's why he's like, oh, it, they didn't hit that often. I'm thinking, that's not true. You're taking that report wrong. But there's somebody else told a story about how they worked for Palladium and they rode a motorcycle. And Kevin was claiming up and down that motorcycles didn't have an electric starter. That they were still Kickstarter. And the guy took him out and showed him his motorcycle that I have an electric starter. Most motorcycles have kickstart and electric starter. And Kevin just would not let it go. I'm pretty sure Kevin's on the spectrum. <laughs> I'm on the spectrum would... and I and and I'm and I'm like, that's fucking stupid. Well, once he gets something in his head, that's the he's also people people can say what they want about him, but he's very intelligent. Yeah, I've n I've never que I've never questioned that. I've I've my my critiques have been have been on have been on presentation and yeah. and just cert, certain 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 um, things that I feel are a oh, I can are bag a, on it all day. Are a, it's if I if I ever if I ever find that um that expose that Bill Coffin did I'd I'd probably want to send that to you to see if you could to see if you can fact check or or give better context to what he said because obviously I'm well, not going to get the other side of the story with what he claimed. Yeah, uh, Kevin was a different Kevin was a different kind of person. But D and D design, well game designers back in the day were a lot different. They had they oh god what gets me is all these designers are up there oh i'm designing a clone 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 i am Fuck's so sake, fucking band. sick of hearing the phrase fantasy heartbreaker oh god it's like you know what it reminds me of you know what it reminds me of it reminds me of remember when wow had more people than some countries playing it at any given moment mm -hmm. remember when wow when you logged on sometimes because they had all those servers and sometimes you sat in the queue for four hours Mm -hmm. Remember when I think they estimated at one point there was 54 million people online at any given time in WoW. That's mm -hmm. bigger than some countries. Yeah. And remember all the other you know you'd be you'd be scrolling stuff on scrolling stuff on the internet and would see oh the next big WoW killer, and you can't even name those games. I mean I, how many how many people have heard of Dungeon Runners? Me. Yeah, it was supposed to be the next big WoW killer. Anytime I don't even some, know if it got somebody, out of beta. <laughs> anytime somebody claims that a game is a is a killer, of whether or whether it be wow, yeah, the the you are sent you essentially are killing whatever whatever prospect it ha it has before it can even start. Yeah. Right now, one of one of the big one of the big one of the biggest players in the MMO genre is Final Fantasy fourteen. FF fourteen had a rough start. Oh got, God! It did. Got re got rebooted when Yoshi P took over because he had a much stronger background, and there's multiple reasons oh. why it had a rough start. One of the big ones I focus on is they were still designing as if they were designing a sequel to FF11, but that yeah. wasn't gonna fly. But um, after after the theme park design that came out with WoW, that just wasn't gonna fly anymore. No. And th then Yoshi P took over. He's Outright admitted that he took WoW as, that he took inspiration from WoW along with a bunch of other stuff, and before then he was involved with the Japanese version of Ult of Ultima Online, I believe. He 
as he, a best-selling author, you don't take from the losers; you you steal from the winners. Yeah, and that ga- the when that reboot, A Realm Reborn, was never never at one point styled itself as a WoW killer. It was more focused on just doing what do, using the mythos that they already had and do and doing a story that'd bring people in. And it's worked. The, o- the only reason Champions Online lasted as long as it did was because they shut down they shut down City of Heroes. And I'm gonna stick up for City of Heroes. It's mm-hmm. been twenty years and you still in most MMOs you still don't have the quality of life stuff you had in City of Heroes. Oh yeah. And still to this day you don't have it. I think the I think the other reason ch- there's multiple reasons why Champions was 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 kind of doomed, and I'd say one one of the other um, big ones was perfect was Perfect World are very Perfect World and Cryptic are a very bad combination together. Like yes, Crypt. I don't know I don't know what happened with Cryptic because they struck gold with City of Heroes, but everything they've tried to do since has been duds. The uh, what's funny is uh, is City of Heroes succeeded despite NC Soft and Cryptid. It wasn't that they uh, what what they struck gold and they did it right. No, it it succeeded. Well, where City City of Heroes took off because it was the only comic book one. Mm-hmm. But I'll tell you where they did the really good job is is when they were able to look at it and say the guy in charge of City of Heroes is a fucking moron who wears a cape to work and demands to be called by his character's name. I did City not hear Heroes, about that. City of Heroes made a huge mistake. I think it was issue three or four. But this dumbass sat on a fucking plane playing his little fucking... I think he was playing a Game Boy or some shit. Cause, and he's playing... And he talked about how you know, he had to try it over and over and over to win. And so he felt this real big sense of accomplishment. So when he gets back, he pushed a patch and an update that nerfed the character's so bad that you had a you only had a 50 50 chance of beating a computer controlled guy your own level and he said well the players will enjoy the challenge that was the fastest patch rollback in fucking video game history i mean that, people that is a lost master their class of mi- minds that is a master class of of missing the point it's it's almost yeah. like it's almost like saying that you're that you're a big damn deal because you survived the Nintendo hard era, and yeah. the the that is something you might be able to get away with that in a single player game, because well Freedom Force can be pretty can be pretty challenging as it is, and that it but that's not a, not an player. MMO where you're playing superheroes that's not superhero you hero. couldn't get even if you weren't playing superheroes it'd be a bad idea because. An MMO is about simulating a world that you're immersing yourself in, yeah. and when and when you tr- when you um when you try and do that kind of challenge, you end up having the same problem that WoW has with some with some of the with some of the raids that are so clearly built for the world first crowd, which is yes. a minority of a minority of a minority of a fraction. The world first crowd is that the ones where that's not the ones that ma- that look at your gear score, is it? The world first ones are the ones who try and be the first ones to complete a, to complete a raid oh, when it comes yeah. out. And Fuck the problem people. is the because of the because of the uh, because of the um, kowtowing to that crowd, you end up with with raids that require an insane amount of coordination to uh, to advance, and. Um, there's a concept in game design called flow theory. I'm not. I can't. I can't say that I came up with it, but it's one that's been floated around. And think of think of um, difficulty and time as an x and y axis on a chart. If you have too much difficulty okay. over time, if the difficulty goes up too much, you end up with frustration. If the yes. difficulty increases too low over time, you have boredom. Yep. That introducing that kind of cha- that kind of challenge is something that you can only do when you give people the tools to su- to succeed. And with a lot of MMOs, there's too many moving parts to do that. You can do that in say an action game because the tools are going to be significantly more limited. It's the reason I don't care for um, cases in MMOs or in R- or in RPGs where the way to the way to beat an obstacle is with a very specific build. 
you can't assume that people are going to know that. Yeah, and you don't, if you just drop that dungeon, you can't assume somebody's going to know that build before they go in. I mean, and I, that's one thing. Uh, that's one thing. Uh, balance. I've uh, ever since the ever since the early two thousands, I would tell everybody else, you know, that balance is all well and good. You should strive for it, but you. Can't, but this perfect, ba- perfectly balanced shit is going to turn into the game of big gray goo. And I was like, there are going to stuff that are going to be unbalanced. Just play styles. Play- the number one unbalancing thing in a t- in a tabletop game, or hell, even in a computer game, is play style. I mean, I watch these people that play Hearts of Iron four and can start with the most pathetic fucking country on the map, and they gimp themselves, and they still end up taking over the world in six years. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, how in the? F- it's their play style, and th- that's the most unbalancing thing. And I came up with, I came up with a saying, and I people fucking hated it. Was if you build it, they will run you over with it. And I was like, no, you need to concentrate more on balance. I'm like, you're literally bitching about one fucking hit point of damage per round. Well, that that's unbalanced and unfair to the. Of course, it's always it's unfair to the mages. Of course, it is. But uh, it, everybody wants balance. Everybody wants balance. Everybody wants balance. And they want balance, balance until until they don't. Yeah, it, per, it perfect balance is even in video games is impossible to do. There is all. There is always. I I play more I play more than my fair share of fighting games, and in most in most some some have some having a harder time with this than others. But there's always going to be that one character that ends up get that ends up getting banned because yeah. because of how how abusable they are. Like in when I was when I was involved in Tekken three tournaments, it was Eddie, just because just because of how cheap he could be with stun locking people for l- lengthy um, combos. We talked about Odd Job earlier. <laughs> yeah. Um there's always there's always going to be those ki- those kind of builds. The the Final Fantasy project I've been working on lately, I do and I encourage people to find ways to come up with crazy builds instead of try mm-hmm. because I realize if I try if I try and nerf all that stuff in the name of balance, I'm going to be Sisyphus pushing up a boulder. No matter how yes. much I push it, I'm going to I'm going to be right back at the bottom of that hill. And so, there is always that guy you know who he is mm-hmm. he's the guy that see, that takes this what looks like an innocuous an innocuous set of feats or maybe a weapon combo and the next thing you know he's solo face rolling dragons i found a way to do <laughs> to do a particular build that was that was just me that was just me going full daka with magic missile yeah <laughs> where i'm fi- where i'm fire where i'm lo- i'm firing off like 123 shots of magic missile in one round. Yeah, and it's like it, there's always that guy. Mm-hmm. And there's he will always be out there. So it, it's I f- I remember I think I think anybody who wants to get into game design should read A Theory of Fun. Mm-hmm. You know, because I have, he, but, uh... he taught he talks about rewarding people for coming for overcoming obstacles. But and I, th- I think th- I th- if there's any um, coda that we c- that we can have in this conversation, it is, fuck the mages, start having fun. <laughs> mm-hmm. But with that said, I do want to thank you for com- for coming all the way over here and and ra- and wrangling, scheduling, and time zone hell. <laughs> yeah. Even though we're technically in the same time zone. But uh, well, I work nights. I work, you know, I do. St- I work nights, and I don't go to bed until like six or seven in the morning. Mm-hmm. So, you know, yeah. it's like, you know, get up at one o'clock, I'll be dead. <laughs> but yeah, now, now that I know that I can, pre- I can prepare for the, for the future if I do this again, but with, but with that said, like, like I said, thanks for, com- thanks for coming on. If th- yeah. anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. I always tell people drinking is not mandatory here, but it is encouraged. Yes. Yes. Yep. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. 
But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody. Good night. <laughs>